So at, at this point, I want to turn to Pam Carlin to talk about the judiciary and judges and sort of how we got in this fix and, and why judges, tell us from your point of view why judges matter. Okay, so I, I want to start with a little story uh, that was told by Joe McCarthy. Um, <laughs> no, no, not the satanic senator. Um, but the former manager of the New York Yankees. Uh, and he said once that uh, he had this dream in which the devil challenged him uh, to a baseball game. Uh, and Joe McCarthy was up in heaven, and he looks around and he says, well, oh, I don't know why you're challenging me to a game, because my team is going to be Babe Ruth and Hannes Wagner and Lefty Grove. These are all, for those of you who are young in the audience, these are all famous players of the Joe McCarthy uh, Era, I mean, you know, it could be A Rod for you for you guys. Although he's, um, so he says, you know, so I'm going to have all these players. What's the point of this game? And the devil says to him, Yeah, you've got the players, but I've got the umpires. Um, and that's actually, in a nutshell, my point today. If you look at the topic of the panel today, it's the Constitution, Congress, and the courts. And I want to talk about the linear relationship between these three entities, which is the Constitution is written uh, in very broad language about very broad principles that were intended to endure uh, for a long period of time uh, and to be applicable to a nation that the framers knew would emerge, but they didn't know in what form. Uh, that's why the most important parts of the Constitution are written in broad and sweeping language. Uh, but one thing we do know is that at the second framing, in the Reconstruction era, when Congress fundamentally remade the United States, and those amendments remade the United States in a way, it's hard to understand how profound it is. Before the Civil War, if you read uh, Supreme Court decisions that talked about the United States, they used the plural. They would say the United States are at war with Britain in the War of 1812 and the like. After the Civil War, that's where you get the United States being used as a singular phrase. The United States uh, is at war. Uh, so when the Reconstruction Amendments were enacted, what they said was they gave Congress special power to enforce by appropriate legislation the guarantees that go into the rights of citizenship, the guarantees of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, and the Due Process Clause. And they gave Congress that power in part because they distrusted the Supreme Court. I mean, today the Supreme Court is living off of the fumes of Brown against Board of Education. That's why they have such power in our country. At the, end of re at the middle of Reconstruction, they were living off of the fumes of Dred Scott. And the Supreme Court uh, was not the place you went to get equality. You went to the legislature and like. So the Constitution's broad sweeping powers are given their real life meaning by Congress. If you ask, where did we get uh, equality? It's from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you ask, how is it that the 15th Amendment actually enfranchised African Americans? More African Americans were enfranchised in the first two years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 than in the entire prior century through judicial enforcement alone. And that's because Congress banned literacy tests when the Supreme Court wouldn't. Congress uh, gave people the right to register when the courts didn't. But then we come to the last phrase up here uh, on the, on the uh, 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 poster, and that's the courts. And so far, we haven't been talking much about the courts. We've been talking about the court in the singular. And I think it's really critical for people to understand that this is not mostly about what the Supreme Court does. In the end, it's very important what the Supreme Court does. But it's just as important what the district courts and the courts of appeals are doing, and no one is paying attention right now to that. That is, the administration is not moving judges onto those courts who are prepared to enforce the capacious guarantees of the Constitution directly and to enforce what Congress has done. Uh, and no one is paying any attention to this, and it's really critical that we do this, because let me just say something about Iqbal as a perfect example of this. What Iqbal says is courts are supposed to determine whether the plaintiff's claims have been plausibly pleaded. And then what the Supreme Court goes on to do in Iqbal itself, which is a case 
uh, alleging uh, unconstitutional uh, ethnic and religious-based sweeps after 9-11 is the Supreme Court says, is it plausible to think that after 9-11, uh, high government officials uh, frightened by the invasion of American soil uh, might have used race as one of the bases for sweeping people up? And the Supreme Court says, we don't think that's plausible. <laughs> and to that I have only one word to say, I know what word you think I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, but that's not actually the word. The word I'm going to say is koromatsu. Plausible, it's like, you know, do I believe in it? I've seen it done. Um, now, if we had judges like UW Clemen on the bench being asked, is it plausible to believe that there was racial discrimination in a particular case? Is it plausible to believe that an employer uh, hid something from the employees? How that plausibility is going to be determined is going to be very different than if we have on the bench people who don't believe in discrimination because it's never happened to them. And so it is absolutely critical to having the Constitution enforced and to having respect for Congress that the judges who enforce the Constitution understand what the Constitution means and be prepared to defer to Congress when it's appropriate and to overturn Congress or state legislatures when it's inappropriate. That's what that says it. Thank you very much. You're welcome.